Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your, your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Abigail Matthews, a graduate student in the Department of Computer Sciences. I'm focusing on operating systems, and but I'm originally from Messina, New York. During the month of November, Badger Talks Live is featuring some of the exciting activity in the School of Computer and Data and Information Sciences. I'm pleased to introduce the Carl DeBoer Professor and Susan Beth Howitz Professor of Computer Science, Andrea Aparci Dussault. Today, she'll be talking about the Catapult Club and how UW Madison students are showing fourth and fifth graders how they can design and implement their own computer games, stories, and interactive art. Over the 20 years she spent at UW Madison, Andrea has primarily focused on file and storage systems, but has also made significant contributions in distributed systems, virtualization, and scheduling. She and her colleague and husband, Ramsey, received the highest honor in the field of systems, the SIGOPS Mark Weiser Award for Outstanding Leadership, Innovation, and Impact in Storage and Computer Systems Research. Andrea has co-advised 28 PhD students, co-chaired numerous industry symposia and tech conferences, and won awards for best paper and most papers authored at the top file and storage system conferences. She has helped hundreds of UW-Madison students connect with thousands of children in the Madison community and was awarded the prestigious Van Nuys Outreach Teaching Award for her work. Andrea will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to post them in the chat at any point. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrea Aprati to so. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Abby, for that very kind introduction. Today, I'm thrilled that I have the opportunity to talk with you all about the Catapult Project at UW-Madison, where we are teaching UW computer science students how to introduce CS concepts to fourth and fifth graders in the context of weekly after-school clubs. So most of the UW students have never taught before, so we teach the UW students the skills they need for co-leading these clubs in a community-based learning course called CS402, Introducing CS to K-12 Students. We've been leading our Catapult clubs since fall 2008, and we've grown gradually from one after-school site up to 17 sites. So at our peak pre-pandemic, we were teaching more than 200 fourth and fifth graders every semester. So today I'll give you some motivation for our Catapult Clubs, describe what we cover in our community-based learning course, CS402, what we teach in our Catapult Clubs themselves, and then leave you a little bit with our future plans. All right, so for motivation, I think it makes sense for you all to know a little bit about my background and what is happening in computer science these days. My main area of research is not in CS education, but actually in computer systems, which includes operating systems, distributed systems, file and storage systems. The part of my job that I probably enjoy the most is advising PhD students in their research. My husband, Remzi Arpachi Duso, and I, we co-advise all of our students, and we've advised almost 30 students through their PhDs. You can see some of their colorful uh, dissertation covers here on various uh, consistency issues, distributed storage system issues there. Um, they've all gone on to have exciting career opportunities, whether as faculty members in other highly ranked CS departments or in research labs, industry, and startups. Then I usually teach our undergraduate and graduate courses on operating systems and distributed systems. You may have heard how lately our enrollments in computer science are skyrocketing. And as a result, where I used to teach about 60 students in undergrad OS, we are now teaching more than 300 students in that course every semester. All right. So many of us in computer science are participating in these exciting research projects, and we're seeing this tremendous rise in demand for our courses. And you may have heard that CS is now the most popular major at UW-Madison. So in the past 10 years, our department has worked very hard to teach as many students as we can about computer science. And as a result, we've experienced more than 800% growth in the number of CS majors at UW-Madison. So we now have more than 2,000 majors in our department. And there's no indication that this demand for CS is going to end anytime soon. They're showing some statistics here. You'll see that uh, in the state of Wisconsin alone, reportedly there are more than 9,000 computing related jobs that are open every month. While we only have about 1,400 students who are graduating with a CS undergraduate degree each year across the state of Wisconsin. So clearly we need to keep reaching more students. Oops. All right. 
So while yes, we need to educate many more students in computer science, a big issue for me and for many other people is that we're not really reaching a diverse group of students. For example, there was one semester where I was teaching the undergraduate OS course to 120 students, and there was not a single female or under represented student in that class. So I found that very disheartening and thought I should try to work on that problem as well. So here's some statistics that show how CS compares to all of you of UW-Madison for last year. So we can see um, across all undergrads, about 51% of our population is women, whereas of CS majors, only 17% of those majors are women. And then of our graduate students, the percentage is a little higher at 22%. And then for CS faculty, it's lower again at 11%. So we're not doing quite the same as the rest of the UW campus for CS majors with women. Uh, with underrepresented groups across all of UW campus, we have about 12%. Uh, that's kind of our benchmark. That's what we would hope the CS major could be similar to. But for our CS major, we're seeing that only 6% of our undergrads come from underrepresented groups. And then of graduate students, it's only 2%. And CS faculty, it's, it's 0%. So if you look at how we're comparing here in CS to other universities across the US, we're actually pretty similar. It's a problem everywhere, not here. And we certainly are doing many things to help with recruitment and retention, especially once they're already in our CS department. But it seems to be the case that if we wait until students come to college to decide that they want to be CS majors, we are waiting too long. We have to start recruiting them sooner. All right, so let's look at the statistics for CS in high schools across Wisconsin. So over the past years, what we're showing in this graph here is the percentage of high schools that offer a course in fundamental CS, some of the concepts of computer science. And we are doing a good job with increasing the percentage of schools that offer such a course. Back in 2017, it was only 34 percent. Now in 2020, we're up to 66 percent. So the result of that is that 90 percent of Wisconsin students do attend a high school where they could take a foundational CS course, which sounds pretty encouraging, except the problem is, is that less than 5 percent of high school students are actually choosing to enroll in a CS course even when they have that opportunity. So we'd really like to get that number up and have more of our high school students taking CS. And then again, when we look at the diversity of those students, we see that it is not as diverse as we would like, and that of those students who take a CS course, only 23% of those students are female. So I would love to change both of those statistics. All right, so where does that leave us? I think that's probably too late to encourage a diverse student group to take their first CS course when they reach college. And it's probably too late even once they reach high school because uh, many studies have shown that most students make up their minds about what they like and what they think they're good at before middle school, before sixth grade. So our goal with the Catapult Project is to introduce students to computer science when they're still in those malleable years of fourth and fifth grade and get them to see what's interesting about it and why they might like to do CS. All right, so let me reiterate our motivation for the Catapult Project. In the future, I think everyone would benefit from knowing something about computation, not how to just sit passively and watch video games and uh, watch videos on your own device, but to be able to create projects that you've designed and to solve problems that you care about with computation and to know the tools for how to do that. Uh, we know that CS as a field is growing, but we aren't attracting a student population that matches our overall undergraduate or general society population. And we think we can dispel some of the negative perceptions that some students develop about CS and technology if we could reach them before middle school. Now, what I mostly want students to know about computer science is that it can be very creative and it can be very fun, and that it's also very understandable and not mysterious. So our goal then with these after school clubs is just to ignite a spark in kids interests and then hopefully motivate them that they want to learn more about CS later in high school or middle school. All right, so I think now would be a great time to share an overview video with you all. In the video, you'll hear from a few of the fourth and fifth graders who are participating in one of our catapult clubs, as well as some of the UW-Madison CS students who are enrolled in our community-based learning course CS402. Then after that four and a half minute video, I'll go into more details about what we do. We're learning to program and create games. We code using the coding language Scratch, which uses blocks as JavaScript. Some of it is kind of tough, but it's mostly really fun. 
No, I oh. walked straight into lava. Oh. I decided that it would be a good idea to teach fourth and fifth graders more about computer science. UW professor Andrea Arpachi Dusso is an expert in operating systems, but her passion is connecting young students with computer science. Pretty much everything now and in the future will have some sort of like computer in it. After school clubs seem like a great place for kids to get more exposure. We need people to understand that computer science isn't just sitting in the dark all day. <laughs> that computer science can be fun and challenging and it's really worthwhile. So I decided to create a class where UW students would get the skills for teaching computer science. I'm learning how to make it exciting and simple. They have not taken any previous classes in education, but they feel some passion about teaching kids. We want to inspire them. <laughs> in the class, we try to give them the skills for leading the clubs. Interpersonal skills, how to like interact in a group. We do a lot of role playing in the class. And then you do A and then B. The other college students pretend to be the fourth and fifth graders. <laughs> Professor Andrea will let you know anything that you're not clear about that the kids might not get it. We will either raise our hands and start saying what does that word mean. It's a service learning class which means that they are learning at the same time while they are providing service back to the community. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. The first day we are so overwhelmed because you know the kids are just active, keeping asking you questions. How do I color it? But um, I think I learned a lot. Now I can hand out, you know, three kids ask me the same question at the same time. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to help you first and then I'll get you two guys, all right? Just in a second. They're friendly, they're smart, they're kind of like me. <laughs> we try to start off each day with an unplugged activity. Yeah. We get them hands-on, either moving around or like interact in some sort of way. They can learn that not only is computer science a computer activity, but it's also a social activity too. And then they sit down and like code their own project. The kids really have to use their brains. Some of them are brilliant. Like, I've had the students show me things in Scratch that I didn't know. That's cool, that's cool. They're great mentors to these kids. Bigger. They're smart and they're just really kind. Well, the goal of it is to create the Frogger game. They spent a lot of time making printouts. I know it takes a lot of time, so I have really a lot of respect for what they're doing. We don't expect that most of the fourth and fifth graders will become computer science majors, but I do think they're going to walk away from club with more of an understanding as to what a computer scientist is and does. It's good to pass the knowledge on to the younger generation. I can just keep on doing it and then practicing and learn some more stuff. I can actually teach other kids. It makes me think about what I should do when I grow up. I'm going to become a scientist. I'm interested in art and to be a doctor. Computer science will help lots of other fields as well in engineering and science and even in art. I want to be a computer engineer. This is kind of like a head start. So you already know one language of coding. This is definitely the class that changed a person. A lot of the UW students want to continue volunteering and have tried to start up computer science club for kids in their communities. Club is almost over. No. Uh, UW students have gone back to India and started clubs there, have gone back to England and done that. You have to instill that excitement, that energy, and then they're going to want to learn on their own. So oh, I hope that you all enjoyed that video and now you have a good idea about what Catapult is. I thought I would now go into some of the aspects of Catapult in more detail. So let me tell you about our name and our logos. So the name Catapult works for a few different reasons. Uh, first, the letters of Catapult stand for different concepts that we want to cover in our clubs. So first, the C and the T stand for computational thinking, where we teach the children about algorithms, which are basically just precise step-by-step -step instructions for solving a problem. And the P stands for programming. We teach the kids how to program in a language called Scratch that I'll talk more about. L stands for logic. We go over some fundamental concepts like OR and AND operators. And finally, T for technology, how computers work.
So I think catapult also gives a nice visual for propelling or launching kids forward in their knowledge of computer science. And then very conveniently, the main character in the programming language, Scratch, happens to be a cat and he's very cute. And we put him in a Wisconsin sweater here for some of our logos, All right? And then this, uh, the instructions down here, those are in scratch blocks. And so we have this forever loop where we're saying University of Wisconsin-Madison is an instruction block that we've created. And then we say computer science, and then we go to our catapult clubs, and then we set the scratch club variable to uh, CS402. And so we print that logo on some of our t-shirts that the UW students wear when they go out and lead the clubs. Okay. All right, so a fundamental part of our catapult clubs is that they are led by our UW-Madison CS students, but our first catapult club back in fall 2008 was at Shorewood Elementary and was led by myself and two volunteers that I recruited. And so leading that club for my, by myself for a few semesters gave me a lot of experience about the types of activities that would work well for fourth and fifth graders, you know, the details of Scratch, the types of projects that you can create, and also a lot of the issues that arise and just all the details of teaching fourth and fifth graders when you don't really know how to do that. So I was able to infer the skills and the knowledge that the UW students would need at a minimum to successfully lead a catapult club on their own. But I didn't really know how I would involve UW students and I tried a bunch of different approaches um, and it turned out that what worked best was when I met someone uh, over in the biology department, Dolly Ladin, who was leading a community-based learning course that was connecting UW students to lead after-school STEM-based clubs. And I was able to adapt her model for our UW CS students. And so this community-based learning approach worked really well. And you might be wondering what community-based learning is. So I'm a big fan of this. The idea is that it is a course-based credit-bearing educational experience that meets needs that have been identified by the community that you're reaching. And so community-based learning, or CBL, CBL, is really a partnership between the community and us so that both the community and the UW students benefit. As part of this CBL course, the UW students, they gain greater appreciation of CS education, and they definitely do enhance their sense of civic responsibility. So as far as impact on the community, our catapult program has really taken off over the years. Uh, we're now at 17 sites. Well, we were at 17 sites pre-pandemic around Madison. And at first, I had to work really hard to encourage schools and the community that their students would benefit from having a catapult club. I would talk to principals or the after-school service provider or any parent who was interested and convince them of this. But then after we had clubs at a couple of different schools around Madison, word got out through the community and different parents would hear about our clubs and they would approach me and contact me saying that they would like to start a club at their elementary school for their children. So that's been our general approach. It's pretty much ad hoc. We find out about a school where there's someone who wants this club to happen and then we send them UW students to make it work. All right. All right, so then with strong support from the CS department, we were able to create our own community-based learning course, CS402, back in fall 2012. And this is a photo of the CS402 class one semester where we had about 50 UW students enrolled wearing uh, some UW t-shirts there for our spirit. Um, in CS402, we meet as a group one night a week and we give the students enough practical skills in that course so that they could co-lead a weekly club successfully somewhere out in Madison at some after school site, an elementary school, the Madison Children's Museum uh, uh, Community Center. And then the students generally work in teams of about three at each site. And we found that three UW students is about the right ratio for a club of 16 enthusiastic, very active fourth and fifth graders. Uh, in CS402, we provide all the setup for the clubs. We've partnered with each of the schools and we have a site coordinator at each location who provides like the official supervision and helps with any unusual issues that arise, uh, you know, enrolls the kids, make sure that we have space and things like that. And then help with from the mortgage center, we figure out how each of the students will get transportation to their site, whether by bus or carpooling or through an Uber or Lyft. Uh, we then give the UW students a sample 12-week curriculum that we've tested in the past. And the, the idea is that they can use that 12-week curriculum as a safe starting point, you know, that that club 
curriculum will work pretty well, but we really encourage the UW students to make that curriculum their own, teach material and show scratch projects that they're interested in and their kids will be interested in as well. That every site definitely has a different vibe and different interests of their students. And so we try to meet that. Um, we use some of our class time in CS402 to talk about practical issues like classroom management, uh, formative assessments, or how to figure out what the kids are learning and what they're interested in, and a little bit about pedagogy like Bloom's taxonomy and growth mindset and things like that. Uh, we use a lot of our one evening a week class time for the UW students to have time to prepare their lessons for their clubs and then to practice their lessons with other groups and get feedback from them, talk with other groups about what's going well and what they could all improve on. And the UW students definitely learn a lot from each other in that time that we have together. All right. Oops. This is not what I expected. <laughs> um, okay, so what does a typical catapult club look like? Uh, most of our clubs are immediately after school for one hour. They're usually about 16 fourth and fifth graders in each club, but sometimes our clubs might just have 12 kids or sometimes they go up to 20 kids. Uh, sometimes we've taught second and third graders, but we've found that uh, teaching fourth and fifth graders definitely works best. Most of the time, the kids are relatively new to Scratch, and that's certainly the easiest case for us when all of the fourth and fifth graders have the same amount of experience. But sometimes fourth and fifth graders want to return to the club a second, third, or even fourth time, and then the UW students are able to adapt their lessons and come up with projects that are more appealing for returning students. Um, as I said, we always have a site coordinator in the room with the UW students, and we usually have three UW students there. Uh, the way we structure each club is that we found it's best to start with an interactive lesson going over some programming concept like repeat loops or if statements, uh, you know, variables. Then the UW students try to act out how that concept works and then they show how to use that concept in Scratch. And then they'll show some motivating Scratch project like an art project, a story or a game that uses that concept that they've just introduced. And we found that the UW students really only have 15 minutes of this interactive lesson time before the kids get very antsy and the kids want to go use the computers and program and scratch themselves instead of watching someone else do it. So in our interactive lessons, we try to use very engaging methods. For example, one of the ways we introduce students to the idea that computers do exactly what you tell them to do and execute exactly the instructions that they've been given is to have one of the UW students shown here he, uh, he's acting as a robot and he's trying to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and he only follows the instructions given to him by others. So the idea is that the robot will take every instruction as literally as possible and we try to be clever about it and interpret it as wrong as could be so that we'll have a humorous result. So if this child says something like put the knife in the peanut butter but the lid is still on the peanut butter, the knife just doesn't go in and the student doesn't open the peanut butter for them. Then after they figure out how to open the lid and the kid says, you know, put the knife in, the robot will take the knife in the wrong direction, assuming it's safe and it's just a butter knife and they'll put the handle in the peanut butter instead. So we try to misinterpret everything to give the idea that you have to be very precise with your instructions. So our results end up being very messy, but they're usually pretty fun. The kids get into it and the kids hopefully get the message that everyone makes mistakes when they're programming and you just have to be resilient and just keep working on it until you get it right. All right, so after our 15 minute lesson, we then give the kids the rest of that hour club to work on their scratch projects. And they're usually very motivated to do this. Scratch genuinely is engaging and the kids like using it, which makes running these clubs so much fun. The kids like what they get to do. Uh, we have found though that the kids do need to have a rather concrete goal. It doesn't work for many kids to just tell them, hey, go off and explore, create something that you want. They need a little bit of leading to have good ideas there and to know what's possible for them to do. So we generally do show them a sample project, again, art, story, or game, and encourage them to create something similar. It doesn't have to be exact, but it'll have some of the same structure to it using some of the same programming concept. Uh, so while the kids are working, this is the time the leaders tend to enjoy the most because they get to just walk around the room and help individual kids or pairs of kids with the projects that they're trying to create. Um, so debugging other people's projects can be fun. 
Um, we found that it's usually helpful to create some type of hint sheet or a challenge sheet that we can give to the kids while they're working on the task so that um, we don't have to keep answering the exact same questions for all 20 kids in the room, but they usually do still end up all asking the same questions. So this is what one of our hint sheets might look like for the first week of a club. I will try to show them some useful blocks that they might want to be using in their project, give them some steps, this kind of breakdown of the algorithm or the instructions that they might want to do for their project, and then something that they could take home to show their parents and say, hey, this is what I learned in club today. All right, so let me talk more about Scratch. All right, so um, I love the Scratch programming language. It's absolutely great for this age group. A lot of fourth and fifth graders do end up using it for like an hour of code or for some introduction in school, but not many of them really spend a lot of time with Scratch. So some of the things I like about Scratch are that it's free. It was developed at MIT with the goal of being free. And this is really important when you're trying to do something scalable, when you want to reach 200 kids a semester. There's lots of neat you know, hardware out there for doing robotics projects, but once they cost you know, a couple of dollars a kid, that just ends up getting too expensive for every semester. And, the, and Scratch doesn't require any maintenance for it to work, so that's just wonderful. It also has a really large user community that there's this great website where kids up, well, they, don't, they work on their Scratch projects there. They're able to show their projects there. They can remix other kids' projects, change them, and make them their own. And so that sense of community that's on the Scratch website really keeps kids interested in Scratch and in programming long after our club ends. The third thing that I like is that it's a block-based language, meaning that the kids don't have to type very much. They just drag and drop these blocks that are on the left side of the screen that are in different categories, like these are showing some motion blocks that control how a particular sprite or object in this language moves across the stage. And so they drag these blocks into this script area to compose them, to stack them together. And then when they click the green flag or press play and run it, uh, the action is taking place in this stage over here. Um, so what's wonderful about this block-based language is that it's not possible to create a program that doesn't compile or that has syntax errors. No, no matter what they do, their program is going to run. It might not behave the way that they want it to, but that's still something that they can kind of figure out and work with. I also really like how visual it is. Um, it allows them to create very creative projects and games. And then the result of that is that when they do have bugs or problems, they're usually pretty humorous. It's not like their program just crashes and kills the machine or, you know, produces a wrong output. Instead, it, you know, it does something funny, usually like a character says something at the wrong time or it flips upside down or something isn't detected properly. So the bugs are usually uh, somewhat entertaining when they occur. And then finally, what I really like about this as a CS educator is that I do think Scratch maps very well to other more traditional programming languages like Python or Java or C even. That Scratch has all of the control structures that a person needs to learn about, like if statements and repeat loops and conditionals, and it has variables and it has lists so that you can really write anything in Scratch that you could write in another language. You can do searching and sorting algorithms in traditional uh, CS education activities within Scratch. All right. So I want to reiterate that the Catapult Clubs do more than just teach Scratch programming, though the kids definitely focus on the Scratch aspects. Uh, for teaching CS concepts, there are a set of activities called CS Unplugged that we borrow heavily from. The idea of CS Unplugged is to teach about CS concepts without any programming and without a computer. It's unplugged. So for example, we can teach about searching and sorting algorithms by moving around real life objects and then like searching for some object that's hidden some, somewhere instead of having to program a searching algorithm itself. So it's much more visual and interactive. And so likewise, we can teach about binary numbers in a very intuitive way. For example, it can take a while to explain why the binary number 01001 in binary is equal to nine in decimal. But if you can have kids kind of act out the role of each of these different bits, it becomes much more visual and apparent. So for example, each child can hold one of these physical cards with a different number of dots on it. Each card represents a different bit. And then you explain that if a bit is turned on or if it's a one, then that means that the card is flipped so that the dots are showing. And if the bit is off or it's zero, then the dots are hidden. 
And so then by just flipping these cards appropriately, you can pretty easily see that the binary number 01001, that that's the same thing as eight plus one, which is equal to nine in decimal. So we can work kind of starting with that to help kids make better connections between binary and decimal. But we don't spend a whole lot of time on things like that. We're mostly talking about programming concept and how to do fun things in Scratch. All right. Okay, so as I've said already, our clubs generally run for about 12 weeks each semester. We start over again every semester with a new group of kids, unless they sign up for the club again, and definitely a new group of UW students every semester. So in the UW semester, we have 15 weeks. And so we have like three weeks to prepare and to figure out what we're doing to teach kids. And then after three weeks, they're in front of their clubs uh, teaching about Scratch and CS Unplugged. And so uh, every semester we have a very similar curriculum, but we do try to change it in case we have some kids that are returning from previous uh, semester so that they'll see new things. So usually on our first day, it's an introduction. We go over rules, we motivate them to see how cool Scratch is and all the fun things they're gonna be able to do in it. And then we give them some free time to explore in Scratch. Then we typically organize the semester so that we spend about three weeks on art projects and then three weeks maybe on interactive stories and then a couple weeks on games and then finally we wrap up with some free time that the children can work on a project that's more of their own devising. Um, and so by doing that interleaving, we're able to reach kids that have different interests. Not every child is interested in making games. Some of them are more artistic. So we like to touch on all these different things that you can do with programming or with Scratch. Uh, it also works out pretty well that some of the art projects are able to introduce more fundamental concepts first. So we can talk just about like that most code runs sequentially when it's stacked up. You run one instruction after another. We can talk about what a loop is and how that really simplifies programming. Instead of having to write an instruction 10 times, you can just put it in a loop and tell the loop that it should run what's inside of it 10 times. Um, and then in our stories, we're able to do a lot more with if statements. So like you could write a choose your own adventure story where you could ask the user, what would you like to happen next? And then if they say they want to do this in their story, you then run the code where that's what takes place. So it's pretty natural to use a choose your own adventure story to talk about if statements and decision trees and things like that. Uh, then we usually like to catch the kids up around week seven, do a little formative assessment, figure out what they're understanding, see what we need to review. And if all of that's going well, then the kids are usually pretty excited and wanting to produce some games of their own. Uh, games end up being a great way to introduce variables, which are an important concept. So basically a variable is a container for some value and the value that's in that container can change over time. Um, so it's a little bit different than a variable in math or algebra, but it's very fundamental in computer science that it's a container. And so variables end up being necessary for any game that's like tracking a score or points or the number of lives that you have left. And so uh, kids want to learn about variables so that they can make their game. And then the last weeks of the project, last weeks of the semester, we give the kids more unstructured time to work give them some ideas on what they might like to do for a big end project. And then in our last day, we'll let the kids show off their projects to one another or invite their parents in and have a celebration and show off all the things they've done. All right. Oops. So we found that it's working pretty well to be in the after school environment. We really like that we get to have that relationship with the same kids each week. Um, the kids do generally commit to showing up to all of the weeks of the club, and so we're able to start with like more basic CS concepts and then develop into more challenging things as the semester goes. Uh, we end up help, getting a lot of help from the school to actually do the enrollment and get the kids to be there every week. Uh, but it is a little bit challenging in that the kids have had a full day of school at this point. And so we do need to just make it fun and enjoyable. The kids are tired from being at school. It needs to be fun. But we have to keep a balance here, make sure that our content of those kids' projects is also what we call school appropriate, that the kids often want to create things that they would not want to show their teacher or their parent, is how we'll phrase it. And so I just please keep that school appropriate projects. 
And so our UW students are always trying to figure out, you know, how to do good classroom management, how to keep control of 16 fourth and fifth graders who are having fun. Uh, it's also a little bit challenging that not every kid in the club is interested to the same level. And so that's one of the reasons why we have a range of projects to find different interests, art stories and games. The kids really can create any project that we want. We just really encourage the kids to use that time to be creating their own project. It can be tempting for some of the children to just play scratch games that other kids have created since they're shared so widely. And that's one of the strengths of it, but we want the kids to use that club time to make their own projects and interact and get help from the UW students with that opportunity that they have. So we really work to make sure that we're being inclusive of everyone in the classroom, that some of the kids are quieter, how can we get them to talk, how can we get them to share their questions, how can we get them to want to program with Scratch. Uh, it is just an after school club, the kids aren't required to do any homework, though some of them will work on Scratch quite a bit during the week. Some of them will continue with Scratch for many years after they're done with this club. So some of the projects that the kids create, the UW students will say like, I couldn't have created that. So they really do put a lot of work into it. Uh, we do find that fourth and fifth graders are an excellent demographic for these clubs. We have tried working with second and third graders. Uh, that's a little bit challenging because the second and third graders don't follow directions quite as well. And following directions is really important with programming to be able to concentrate and do just one step at a time. And second and third graders, they don't all understand uh, XY coordinate system and negative numbers. We certainly go over that quite a bit because that's very fundamental in these very visual games to be able to specify where an object is on an XY coordinate system. And that seems to be good for fourth and fifth graders. Uh, we've sometimes also tried to work with sixth to eighth graders and high schoolers. Uh, that's also been challenging because the older kids kind of already have their ideas about whether or not they want to do this. And if they don't want to do this, then it's too much of a challenge for our UW students to get through. And if they do already like computer science, then they tend to be pretty advanced and they do want to do something beyond scratch. So fourth and fifth grade ends up being great for us. Uh, we are finding that our catapult clubs are quite appreciated by both the community and our UW students. So I have some quotes here. So the one from Marquette Elementary is from one of the site coordinators at Marquette. Um, and she says that the UW students are always very energetic and the kids love coming and they have great interactions there. Uh, the 402 students, the UW students, often express how they wish that they would have had these opportunities when they were younger, that they wish they could have had a club like this, they wish that they would have been able to program sooner. Um, and we have now had the situation where we have kids who were in the catapult club as fourth and fifth graders, and now they are majors at UW Madison and CS. And we've had some of those students, in fact, even then be the teachers in 402 and go back to Shorewood Elementary and teach the next generation of fourth and fifth graders, just like someone taught them in the past. All right, so um, where are we now? So with catapult, uh, before the pandemic, we had gotten up to 17 clubs around Madison, so that was about 250 fourth and fifth graders and 50 UW students leading these clubs every semester. We we're mostly at elementary schools. We were also teaching at Madison Children's Museum and a variety of community centers around Madison. So that's when things were running smoothly. Then this pandemic occurred. That was a bit rough for us. We moved some of our clubs online and others once we just had to put on hiatus. Uh, the online clubs worked okay, but it, they were a little sad in that the, the kids didn't really want to be spending more time on their laptops on a club, but it, it kind of got us through and it kept our connection solid there. Um, then last year we started going back in person slowly and that has been totally wonderful. The kids love it when we're able to be in person and the UW students love it when we're in person. This spring, we plan to be back at 11 clubs, which will mean we're getting back to 175 kids and we'll have 33 UW students interested uh, doing that again. So if you are in the Madison area and you have a child at an elementary school and you are not on our list of sites and you are interested in having a catapult club at your school, uh, please contact me at my email address there. Uh, it's catapult clubs are free. 
We just need to do a bunch of advanced planning. We're, so at this point, we'd be planning for our fall 2023 clubs with what we need to do to get set up there. But we basically just need a parent or a teacher who is willing to be the site coordinator and be present in the club each week and help us with enrollment. And we are happy to show up and teach kids about computer science. So in the future, what we'd really like to do is to figure out how to expand across the state of Wisconsin. So we are currently talking with CS departments at some of the other UW campuses and figuring out, can we have like this, a joint CS 402 that is perhaps taught online and then they would have connections with their local schools or local after school providers uh, to teach, um, teach fourth and fifth graders in other parts of Wisconsin. But we also have a bit of work to do just to get back up to our original 17 clubs in Madison, that those are all individual connections that we have at every site, and it takes some work to get that going again. So if you're interested in hearing more about the Catapult project, I have a URL down there from my personal web pages that you could see more about like what it, it takes to start a club at your school. Thank you very much. Wow, Andrea. So this is the Wisconsin idea in action. You're doing it. You're living it. And, you know, we hear so much about uh, a lot of faculty work around the state, but then actually sending these students into these communities. Um, it really is the Wisconsin idea in action. So thanks for that good work. Hello, everybody. Fran Paleo Moyer Badger Talks producer. We're talking with Andrea Arpachi Duso about this amazing catapult club on campus in the Department of Computer Computer Science. A um, couple of questions for you. So, does you mentioned the program is free? Do the students have to have uh, laptops, or does the school provide those? How does that work? It, it's definitely different at every site. So the schools usually do, they used to have a computer lab and we would hold the club in the computer lab. A lot of elementary schools are getting rid of their computer labs and the kids have their own Chromebooks and they can just use their personal Chromebook to go to the Scratch website and Scratch you know, works from a Chromebook. So it's relatively easy to do that. Oh, but okay. it's, so they're using yeah. standard classroom equipment, basically. Standard classroom equipment. Yeah. yeah, when okay. we started it, that wasn't the case. And we did a lot to get a scratch on like the approved Madison software list and get it installed. But now it's just a web application and everything is easy. And do you envision this program moving outside of the Madison area or what's the plans for the future? Yeah, I would really love for it to grow outside of Madison. Um, we are talking with the chairs of other CS departments and other of other UW system schools, and they would very much like to do this program as well. So we're just working through some of the logistics for that of who would actually teach the course at their school, how would they make their connections with their elementary schools, but I'm hopeful that that could happen in another year. So it, it, it takes a while to get going, but I think it'll happen. So your initial statistics kind of blew my mind that you now have an enrollment of 300 students, you're saying. Oh, um, in, in OS, an operating In system. OS, right. Yeah. And that um, also it's the most popular major now, which, you know, wow, that that's really something. And then you're mentioning that there's a lack of diverse students and, and females. Do you attribute that to basically the popularity of video games being with that sort of white male population? Or how do you account for that? Yeah, I don't really like to speculate too much about that. I think there's a lot of different reasons on why some women don't want to go into computer science. So my only hope is that if they could see how awesome it is and what the opportunities are that they would find it more appealing and then once you have more women that they can join a community of then it will feel more natural to be in that environment and to stay there but it is hard for students when they feel like they're one of only a few in a group yeah gotcha my, my sons both are uh, pretty avid video game players and they do have you know one or two females usually kind of hanging out in the group as well that really love it um so any suggestions for teachers or parents who are watching on ways that they could maybe introduce their younger children to this at home 
Yeah, so Scratch is definitely meant to just be like discovered and explored on your own. That just going to this Scratch website, um, you can just, there's a lot of sample projects out there. There's a lot of tutorials that they try to guide kids through developing projects on their own. You know, I think it's better if you can have a UW student guiding you through that and motivating and helping, but it, it works pretty well to do on your own, especially if a parent were, was sitting there with them and exploring jointly and kind of learning along with their child. Yeah, and I got to say, it's super cool that you're able to do this with your husband. So that's super neat. How did you, as a woman, get involved in this field? Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I always liked science and math. Uh, my dad was in IT, and I think he encouraged me to program. You know, we had a Commodore 64, and I just liked to program when I was a kid. Um, I went to an all-girls high school. And I didn't take any CS courses there because uh, I heard they weren't very interesting, <laughs> but I still knew that I wanted to go into CS. And then I just have always liked it, but I would like there to be more in, in my field. <laughs> I am sure of that. Well, excellent. Well, thank you for sharing this program with us today and for sharing it with so many students around the area um, and, and guiding those future computer programmers for us. So nice to chat with you today. Thanks so much, Andrea. Great, thanks. Great. So our focus on the cool things happening in the School of Computer Data and Information Sciences will be continuing next Tuesday at noon. We'll be talking with Information School Professor Katherine Arnott Smith, and she's going to be giving us some very important information about how to evaluate the health information available online today. Also visit us at badgertalks.wist.edu. You'll see the upcoming schedule of talks. We're gonna be taking a little hiatus through the holidays and we'll be coming back in February with a shorter, more condensed flash talk version of Badger Talks Live. You can also sign up for our email list there to get upcoming notices of events. You can search the public events happening all around the state hosted not just by Badger Talks Live, but also groups and com in communities like yours. You can also search the roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff that we have signed up on the Badger Talks website to come into communities like yours um, at no cost. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next week.